Today was Close Your Bank Account Day. This is November 5th, day 36 of Occupy Los Angeles, and you're watching Inside Out News. Many of you here, for completely accurate and important reasons, are concerned about the environment. Some of you here, for very important, noble, and critically important reasons, are concerned about jobs. Some of you here, for absolutely terribly important reasons, want to move to what I think we should have, and that is a single-payer system of health care. Yeah. Some of you are here, and you are right about this. We need to have a military budget that is half or less of the current military budget. But, this is, but my point is, my, here's my point, and many of you have other issues. My point is that if we hang together, if we, not, if we, if we get out of our own issue silos for just a moment, and if we hang together, we have a chance of changing this country. If we get campaign finance reform and get money out of politics, we have a chance of getting our democracy back. About 30 people gathered this morning at California Plaza to close their bank accounts. They broke up into three smaller groups. One group went over to Bank of America, another to Citi, and the other to Wells Fargo. We followed the group over to Wells Fargo. They asked the media to stay outside of the bank so as not to draw extra attention to the closers and not to risk their chance of being able to close their account. I was out there with another cameraman who was from one of the local news stations and we moved up close to the bank. We tried to get, take a peek through the window and as we were peeking through the window with our cameras, one of the security guards came over and locked the front door. After that, he turned on the security gate that comes down in front of the glass at night to protect against robberies. And luckily, someone tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked up and I saw that this gate was just a few inches from my head, so I stepped back. I then moved to the other side of the bank where there was another open window, and I set up there to try to get a peek in. One of the bank closers was sitting uh, talking to one of the Wells Fargo associates trying to close his bank account. So I was there filming to get a peek and as I was, the security guard once again spotted me and decided to close the curtain or the blind so that I couldn't see in. So essentially the media was shut out from the outside, from the inside out by the security. Afterward, security escorted the bank closers out of the bank and we were able to talk to them about their experience inside. Because that's the only uh, you know place they can find work in this economy. Uh, all the businesses are going under and the banks are getting fatter. In fact, they tell me that they just hired two tellers. So uh, I'll be very happy to be, you know, put this little bit of money and uh, other money from other accounts that I need to close into a credit union, community-oriented credit union. Me out, uh, the account is closed. Uh, I'm ready to cut up my uh, Wells Fargo uh, credit card, and uh, I'm assuming that's a photo op for later. How are you feeling? I feel great. It feels good. You know, I. I moved most of my money about six months ago, uh, and I was just lazy and hadn't closed this down, so I'm really glad to be part of this action, and to be doing it in, in these two weeks, in this two-week period is, I think, really positive, because then you, it creates more of a statistic. If I if I'd pulled it out back then, it wouldn't have made it the impact that it is now. So I'm happy to be doing it with my friends and comrades here. After the bank closing, about 500 people gathered again at California Plaza for a major march through the financial district ending over at City Hall in downtown Los Angeles. When the march got close to a local Bank of America branch that is just across from City Hall, they rushed over in front of the bank. And this particular branch happened to be closed on Saturdays, but that did not deter the protesters. They rushed towards the windows and the police seeing this happening, they went and they formed a line in front of the branch to protect it in case uh, anyone, you know, tried to break any of the windows, you know, so what we saw 
happened similar uh, just this uh, past couple of days over in Oakland where some of the protesters were breaking the glass of a Wells Fargo bank. So they were there lined up. Uh, the protesters were peaceful. They were, they were chanting. They were saying, shame, 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 shame. At one point, somebody did in fact throw like some sort of wet towel at the bank. But that was the extent of it. There was, there was nothing else that went on. Eventually, the protesters uh, were satisfied with uh, what they, what they're chanting at the Bank of America branch, and they moved on and they moved, and they marched the rest of the way to City Hall. in here at Occupy Los Angeles, they had a big economics panel that included Robert Reich, William Black, and Robert Shear. At the end of the panel, there was an open question and answer where members of the 300 or so audience were able to come up and ask direct questions to the members. We interviewed Robert Reich earlier in the day. Robert Reich is the former Secretary of Labor under the Clinton administration and currently teaches public policy at UC Berkeley. This movement represents a very optimistic view, which is that something can be done if people join together. Uh, even though the specific demands have not emerged yet, that's okay. But the notion is that if people join together, something positive can happen. The system can be made uh, more fair. And that is hugely, hugely important for millions of people to see and understand. Now, you were the former Labor Secretary under uh, the Clinton administration. So, in terms of jobs, the job situation here and kind of uh, on a global scale, and looking at Europe and the situation in Greece, uh, what can be done with these type of austerity measures that are being pushed? What can be done for the American people or, or for people of the world in terms of, of getting jobs back in place, getting the money for jobs? Look, at austerity is nuts. You can quote me. Okay. Whether it's in the United States or in Europe, uh, the way you revive an economy and get jobs back is not by cutting public budgets. When people are desperately in need, you don't want to cut safety nets. You don't want to cut education. You don't want to cut social services. When people need jobs, you don't want to make, create more joblessness. And that's exactly what's happening. I mean, yes, you have public budgets that, you know, where there's, there's debts, uh, there are debts that are growing in the out years. Well, the first step to dealing with those debts is growing the economy. So the debt becomes a smaller uh, problem as a proportion of the total economy. If you don't grow the economy, if you actually uh, have the economy flat or shrinking, the debt as a proportion of the economy gets larger and larger and larger. And people get more and more angry. Uh, it's a, it's a no-win proposition. Uh, and what are you doing? Uh, you're, you're, just, you're just helping the banks be solvent, but ultimately uh, the people are in worse and worse condition. That, again, that, that, that that puts on its head what the order ought to be. It should be people first, uh, finance second. We also interviewed William Black. William Black currently teaches economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He is best known for his book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. We talked to him a bit about what he calls liar loans and what type of action the occupation needs to do to fix the aftermath of the financial crisis. You could explain a little bit more about liar loans and how that plays into the financial crisis? Certainly. The FBI warned publicly in September 2004, over seven years ago, that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud and predicted that it would cause a financial crisis. 
and then the lending industry's own experts on fraud in 2006 reported three things. First, that loans called stated income loans were an open invitation to fraudsters. Second, that the incidence of fraud in such loans was 90 percent. Virtually every loan was fraudulent. And third, that these loans deserved the term that the industry called them behind closed doors, liar's loans. Well, we know from both an analytics and from actual investigations that it was overwhelmingly the lenders who put the lies in the liar's loans. Why? Because it allowed them to make loans at very high interest rates to folks who would never be able to pay it back. And that is the essence of how you maximize accounting fraud, and it maximizes your bonuses in those folks. So how big are liar's loans? Were they important enough to actually cause this crisis? Absolutely. By 2006, one out of every three loans in America, home loans, newly made, was a liar's loan. So in response, remember to those warnings? No one put a gun. No one ever told a bank they had to make a liar's loan. Right? And banks were warned that they were pervasively fraudulent, and they rushed to increase the amount of liar's loans by hundreds of percent after all these warnings. The, well, since lawyers don't seem to think that fraud exists, it seems like they thought it was a very profitable approach. Right. I mean, how, how could anyone think a liar's loan was fraudulent? Where would the clue be, perhaps, <laughs> in all of this, right? So this is an easily provable fraud. All the investigations show it. The uh, Federal Housing Finance Administration has now, without the benefit of FBI investigation, without grand jury investigations, simply getting normal discovery requests in the civil case, has charged the 17 largest of the largest banks with endemic fraud in the sale of these liars' loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So there, and they also say that there is a clear paper trail establishing that they knew these loans were fraudulent, the lenders, right? So the FB, the Justice Department has no excuse for not prosecuting, but it still isn't, which is why we need to fire not just uh, Geithner, but we need to fire Attorney General Holder. And if the president ever wants to get um, working on the behalf of the 99, we'll know it when those people get fired and they get replaced by people who are actually going to enforce the rule of law. And one last question in that vein. Uh, there's the attorney generals who were uh, doing an investigation. Eric Schneiderman, attorney general of New York, pulled out uh, because he, he wanted to do his own, in, be able to do a state level investigation, but also because he, uh, as I understand, he's protesting against the possible immunity that some of these banks would get. Uh, that seems to fall in place a little with what we've been talking about in terms of the lack uh, or the, the resistance to, to real uh, pressure or real uh, uh, criminal charges being put against them, yeah. justice. In the savings and loan crisis, we convicted over a thousand senior folks of felonies in cases designated as major. To do that, our agency made over 10,000 criminal referrals. In the same crisis, the same agency made zero criminal referrals, and not a single major or even minor Wall Street participant has going to prison for any of this. So the true scandal that people have to rise up and stop, because this will be the formal surrender of the United States of America to crony capitalism, is that the White House and the industry are pressuring the state attorney generals not only not don't prosecute us, don't even investigate us and make public the facts of our fraud. And it is, they are trying for just what you said, immunity against even investigation. So we have to support Attorney General Schneiderman, Attorney General Biden, and Attorney General Harris here in California all of whom have said no to this obscene, obscene position of being able, elites being able to rob with impunity. Unless we block that, 
there is really very little hope for America. So you think that uh, the occupation needs to take more uh, legislative action or write to their senators? Or, well, or the what? occupation has made this issue big in political science jargon salient, right, so that people are actually talking about it. And they've done an immense job for the American people. I don't know that it's up to the various Occupy uh, folks to do, right every wrong, but they've focused attention on it. And the question is, are the American people going to stop it? Will the administration, if this is exposed, and notice the Republicans aren't, the Republicans are attacking everything the Obama administration does except this, which is really the sleaziest thing they've ever contemplated doing. Why? Because both parties' leading source of finance is the finance industry in terms of political contributions. So this is not a party issue. This is the American people have to just like that other phrase, take back their country, but take back from the 1%. Tomorrow is day two of the teach-in. They are having panels on sustainable living and corporatocracy. We will be here to cover those panels and hopefully to bring a few more exclusive interviews to you. This is Margot Pius signing off for Inside Out News. Good night. <laughs>